anybody that's watching us live and thank you very much for your attention it is such a privilege when people provide us with their ears and their hearts and listen to us and our guests on these Wednesdays and so you're tuning in to BIP chat and um, if you are watching this back listening to this back either through YouTube or the podcast channels or maybe on LinkedIn or Facebook thank you very much as well to you and if you're joining in live um, please do make any comments we'll pick them up later we're going to really concentrate and focus which is something that a lot of us challenged with nowadays but focus on what we're doing right in this next 45 minutes and it is our responsibility to keep you entertained and also to help you grow learn new things pick up new little ditties um, and hopefully um, really plug into that growth mindset that Carol Dweck talks about so brilliantly. And um, let me first of all introduce BIP Chat to you before I introduce our fabulous guest today. So BIP stands for Business is Personal. And that's the juxtaposition of when somebody said to me once, Penny, it's not personal, it's just business. And it was like they had put a, I don't know, stabbed me in the stomach and in the heart at the same time gave me a really huge guttural reaction when they said that because business is really personal and to begin with it used to always feel very personal when you were an entrepreneur because you had so much on the line and you worked so many hours and your heart and your sense of purpose went into it so deeply but I've definitely seen this subject spreading massively into the corporate marketplace um, it is hard nowadays especially with remote working to blur the lines between our home life and our business life. And this is the reason that we are today interviewing an amazing expert, really somebody who has uh, devoted many, many years to the subject of looking at how do you, how do you possibly see yourself as two people, the what you do and the who you are? You are one person. And how do you give yourself permission to be that one person and enjoy all the privileges of saying, this is who I am, and these are my skills and what I do. And so it's great to introduce you to Thomas Orths. And Thomas is coming to us from Amsterdam, although he is an international speaker and coach and consultant, travels the world a lot, and works with some really fabulous clients and companies. And um, so Thomas, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. And let me first of all, just tell you, if you're listening, you might want to look up Thomas on LinkedIn. And so it's Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, Orths, O-R-T-H-S. And um, so look Thomas up and connect with him on LinkedIn afterwards if this resonates with you. So Thomas, thank you very much for giving us your time today and joining Thomas and I on the sofa. So we've got two Thomases. I'm yeah. in a Tom Thomas sandwich today. Thomas sandwich. <laughs> I think I think I'm the strawberry jam to this sandwich today. Ooh. <laughs> um, so Thomas, I've introduced you a little bit, but let's start off just making sure everybody understands you a little bit. You've got this business, Well Cellerators, which yes. I think I want to spell so people can look it up. W E L L, so well, and then straight into Cellerator, C E L E R A T O R S. And is that what is that at the end? Dot com? Dot com, yes. It's a yeah. wellcelerators.com. Tell us a bit about yourself and your journey to creating well cellerators. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. First of all, maybe also to my last name, O R T H S. It's a German name, and the English community worldwide, of course, can't cope with it. Mr. Orths. It, it doesn't fly. <laughs> so then they say Mr. Ortis. It was regular. Whenever I checked in in hotels, I'm Mr. Ortis. Hello. I think where's the I coming from? But <laughs> it's, it's just, if you want to O R T Z Orts, that's a German name. It's quite a common German name. Here we are. So you can hear my German accent. Um, I started um, in Düsseldorf with visual communication, uh, advertising studies, uh, very fascinating. Um, but already during my studies, I started to work in direct sales. Long story short, in 2002, I moved to the UK, lived there for 18 years, Manchester, Bolton, uh, traveled the world. Um, it was really the business model was um, coaching, consulting and training wherever I was needed, whether it was the Middle East or Singapore or Shanghai or Frankfurt. Um, and I was paid when I was on the ground with daily fees and whatever comes with it. Um, and I did this for yeah more than a decade um, with 
many ups and downs as well. Um, but then COVID came. I don't want to mention the C word too much, but um, the business model was halted. You know, you couldn't travel anymore. So what do you do? And I was in several consultant coaches, trainer networks, and we scratched our head and say, okay, we have to reinvent ourselves and we have to do even more online. There was some online sessions before for business acquisition and maybe some coaching, but it wasn't mainstream. And yeah, three months later, we were able to, me and my colleagues, to do much more substantial work online. And that gave me a freedom to excel even with online work and giving a brighter, a wider or deeper service. And that is when well acceleration was put on the map. Because if you look at this website, it is almost like a spectrum. There is no line between business and personal development. And I refuse now to travel to clients. There may be some very few exceptions, but if clients need people on the ground, I can send them in. I've got a network of a team of, of experts, but I do online. And that also means now I'm a digital nomad. I did much more travel privately recently. And I'm looking at the moment where I want to have my home base. It's more than one place. So there's one thing in Mexico brewing. We're also looking into other parts of the world. Me and my wife. There we go. So interesting. So, so Thomas, what is the impact that you like to have with your clients? What is it that really is driving you with Well Accelerators? Yeah. Um, I want to focus on what is really working well and doing more of that. Yeah. That's the first thing. I think a lot of time, oh, this is not working. That is not working. Yes, you can look at that. But what is really working well gives you already a groove, a good feeling. And why not do more of that? Even if you improve that a little bit or accelerate that a little bit faster, quicker, better, boom, you are in your flow. You are in a good energy because it was well to begin with. It worked well to begin with. Um, but only doing that would be not holistic. So what is not working so well? And then there's two choices. Either stop it altogether or bring it back into flow. Bring it back to a point where it's flowing, where it's working well. So that would be the angle. Um, so it would be almost like a diagnostic. Where are you at the moment? Um, where do you want to be in whatever time frame? And what is working well right now? What is not working so well? And how can we focus on that to get you there? And it's your personal journey. Might be completely unique and different to your colleagues sitting next to you and and thomas when you sit with somebody and you focus on what's going well and then you you encourage them to build on what's going well to make it even better as you say in the right flow in the right energy typically is there an average number of things that are going well it's a good question um what is interesting of course people say but, but, i mean if you ask an open question which this is what is working well you can't say, uh, then people start to think and they think, what do you mean? Is it like business related or is it like, I think anything that comes, because if something is working well, that's worth focusing on. So is there a certain number of things that come up? No, but probably more than one or two things, one, two, three things come up. Um, and if it's like personal stuff, hey, we, we, we stick with that for a moment. For example, if someone, Let's say I have a real boost in my health. I'm doing much more exercises, whatever. Maybe the person goes into that. Well, it gives huge energy to be a new creator in your life circumstances, whether it's business or private. Um, if someone says we created a supply chain optimization and all of a sudden, and they go into supply chain and business issues, and that is really working well, that's a starting point for a conversation. I want to, I want to have a conversation that is client-led, and this open question, it was also interesting how it came about. Um, previous, let's say 10 or 12 years ago or something, it was more like, I know what companies need and I bring it to the table. Yeah, training or leadership development or whatever. And over the years you learn, it's much more complex than that. And the solution that you have in mind might not be the best solution. So you need to start to ask much more questions before you even start. So I introduced fact-finding calls or fact-finding interviews. So when I go into a project, leadership team, eight people or whatever, um, I want to have a 45 minutes call with eight of them. And then an additional 
10, 10 stakeholders. So we speak to 18, 20 people, fact-finding calls. And this is where this coming came up. So when I do the fact-finding calls, I want to be an open blank page. And my first question is, okay, uh, why are we doing this? We want to find out where you stand. And the first question is, what is really working well in this? Yeah, level? I love that. I love that. And then they say, what do you mean? Business will say anything that comes. It can be process. It can be people. It can be culture. You tell me what is working well. This is how this came from. So I've done those what is working well kind of questions since many years. Um, but in the Well Accelerator's positioning, this website that I created in the last two years, I put this right up at the top. You know, Why don't make that the entry theme to work with someone, to speak with someone, or to find out whether there is a match. That's the other thing. The first conversation determines whether there is a match. Same like we had a conversation, you and I, and you wanted to determine, is there a match between me and the BIP club, for example? So where's a match? And that is a good opening question. What is working well? Where are you stuck? And that that was through a whole process, a whole series of open questions. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, Thomas, most people spend money because they've got a pain that they need to yeah. get rid of. Yeah. What tends to be the hook that gets people to come to you? What tends to, is it? That they just decide I need a business coach, or I'm, what? What? What tends to be the thing that that brings people towards you? Yeah, it's a good point. I think uh, word of mouth travels easy when you do excellent work, you and your colleagues. And again, I want to emphasize me and my colleagues because I'm not a one man show. On the Well Celebrators website, it looks that way, but I know farewell what I can really do as an expert and where I need other experts at my side. So I always have been open to inquiries and some people almost said thomas is a yes man so someone comes and has a certain problem can you do that can you solve that yes either i can do it or I'll bring someone to the table so we had a lot of inquiries from people that we worked with leadership teams uh team players then they change companies then they reach out um and then also okay he also is very good at personal development that goes deeper yeah and then there is an outreach can you help me with this i've got a problem on the private side so i have not been very systematic and that successful in in let's say social media outreach and you can see that in if you follow my social media profile it's, it's not like a big empire at all um word of mouth is basically what it comes to um and i think the fact that i'm quite sensitive or, or able to go under people's skin and go deeper that has led to several outreaches of people and how how often do people come to you with a, a business problem and then you very quickly realize it's much more of a personal problem i would say <clears throat> i would say 70 percent of the time the problem they bring to the table is not really the problem and out of that, 30% of the time, we end up in personal stuff that may even be a surprise to them. You know, there is this, um, I believe in, in coaching, which is more a pull coaching than a push coaching. So, so first of all, I think if you ask 50 people on the street randomly, what is coaching? They, they have this football coach that knows it all and tells. That's telling. That's almost like consulting telling. But if you know what coaching is, you can ask questions, you can ask guiding questions, and you know where you want to go with the coachee, or you ask more open questions that would be pulling out what is in. I believe in that. Um, I did also train the trainer programs in companies to, to install that. And when you do pull coaching, you ask, what is the root of that, you know, and why is this happening? And, and let's go a bit deeper. Why did that come about? And if you go three, four, why is deep? You end up at a different spot than where the conversation started naturally. Yeah. And that is almost like a wow moment or a light bulb moment that, that people can can already see there's something valuable here. You know, we spoke 10 minutes and all of a sudden we are down here where when I came, I thought I was in that corner and wanted to talk to you on that. Yeah, yeah. And Thomas, when you're when you're doing guiding coaching questions as opposed to open pull, pull yeah. out questions. Yeah. When you do your, your 18, 18 to 20, 45 minute fact finding interviews, yeah. and you're asking people what's going well, does, does, does each one of the 18 to 20 give you 
a different so, so do you end up with 18 to 20 things that are going well or do you end up with six because they all say the same thing okay what is very interesting is when you do fact-finding interviews especially when you widen the circle um you are baffled that people can speak about the same thing with two different worldviews um one sees it in a negative way the other sees it in a positive way they talk about the same thing um so if I work in the team context, I would say people pretty much say the same things that are working well with slight variations. Um, but when you go to the things that are not working well, the problems, then there's a whole division of worldviews. Because maybe the person is uh, more or less the reason that things are not working well and he or she can't see it themselves or there is a certain blame culture spreading and who is fueling that fire and who sees it and wants to stop it so then you get really polarized views on the same thing and that's fascinating um but what what i'm portraying here a little bit like i don't always work with teams but i start with leaders and then of course hardly anyone is a lonely wolf yeah so even if you're a freelancer and you're doing your own thing okay who is your support team yeah who is maybe your suppliers who is your so I, I think it's fascinating if I work with a leader, their core leadership team support unit, whatever that is. And if that is really impactful to work, then it can spread from there. Mm -hmm. And do you use any particular tools when you're, you know, there's all these sort of psychometric tools when you're looking at the team dynamics. Are there any ones that you particularly like for that? Yeah, it is interesting. It's, it's over the years, things have been recommended. And it's almost like a treasure box of knowledge. Um, what was very interesting is to me, I'm not that good of a reader, but I'm a very good listener. So audiobooks, even read by the author, uh, they, they excite me even more. In, in, in my decades of flying around the world, overseas long-term long flights, long-haul flights, I listen to so many high-quality audiobooks. So why am I saying that? For instance, EQI, Emotional Intelligence, um, or emotional intelligence development. I was certified in 2007 in one company in, 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 in the UK, JCA, and then later um, another organization, I, I looked into the EQI tool, and that is such a profound tool in my toolbox um, that I don't draw out every time at all. But if, if people really need to see where they stand, um, that is something I'm really passionate about. Um, it's also interesting if you ask people what is emotional intelligence what what is the main thing that comes up that they say they say empathy being able to feel what other people are feeling yes that's one aspect of emotional intelligence but it's one out of 15 scales in the model that i use and uh 12 of the scales all focus on you like stress tolerance impulse control yeah focus and empathy focus on the other person. So I think emotional intelligence has much more to do with yourself than people realize. Mm -hmm. And when you do an assessment and they see the bars and you can develop the bars, then you've got some framework. So that is something I like. And also I'm I'm a, a fan of Erin Meyer and the culture map because I worked in so many, I've spent hundreds and hundreds of days in the Middle East. I worked in China a lot, in Shanghai, whatever. Um, I'm living here in the Netherlands, which is a, multicultural pot of people beautiful so Erin Meyer um fascinating work um the tool is quite light on the website but you can do a lot with that you know it's it's the team culture the company culture and also the roots where you're coming from so these are two highlights um because often I work with international leadership teams and then you've got the French the German the Italian you know the Swedish guy sitting next to each other talking bad English as a business language and there you go. So that is very fascinating. Um, what, are this, what are some of the common issues that you know when you walk into a company that you would expect to, to see? Yeah. And again, whether it's a company or whether it's just an entrepreneur with his support group, I think, um, first of all, lack of clarity. It's fascinating or baffling how much lack of clarity there is so what really is the vision yeah. um, so the vision should be something visual that you can imagine like a picture that is attractive that draws you to it for a lot of people a vision is a sentence that 
is a fancy sentence on the wall. So what is the vision? Um, what are the goals that need to be in place in order to reach that vision one day, one month, whatever? So lack of clarity of goals. Um, and then mission, to me, mission is not the mission stand, statement that the hotel has on the wall, but what does everyone need to do on a daily basis to achieve the goals to make the vision come through? So there's a lot yeah. of, uh, we don't have a vision, we don't have clarity here, we are lacking there. So there's a lot of unclarity. And then, so that's this, this tri, triangle, uh, vision, goals, mission. But then it also comes, what are our rules? Behavior rules and communication rules. What are our roles and responsibilities? And I don't mean a job description. The job description is one thing, but roles and responsibilities, sometimes even informal roles. There can be a leader uh, and he has six people in his leadership team and one is the best person to be the devil's advocate. He can pull everything apart and he does it really well and it helps the team. Another one can be the peacemaker because there's two heated, let's say green, blue to bring some of the analysis in. Yeah? And who's the peacemaker? So you have formal and informal roles. A lot of people have lack of clarity around roles, responsibilities and rules. And finally, yeah. even if you have clarity and all that, if people don't um, acknowledge that and live by it, what happens when nothing happens? Yeah. Great HR question. What happens when nothing happens? Because if no one gives direct constructive feedback to correct it, you can forget all the rest. Why don't you even bother to create clarity if no one lives by it? So the feedback culture yeah. is very often a big sticky point. The feedback culture is, is yeah, that people don't speak their minds. They, they are a little bit treading carefully and they think they're part. And this is where then other problems. So when you're looking at leadership styles, because if you're looking, if we look at some of the psychometric sort of ones that people will relate to, sort of the high, the high red, the red type of leadership style, which was arguably sort of very 80s, 90s type of style of leadership, where it was just tell and don't ask, you know, do and don't ask why you know, that type of leadership style. And I'm sure we've all experienced that. Um, you know, if you get an entrepreneur, a very success-driven entrepreneur that's built a successful business, but they are that type of character, that, that, that is their, you know, they're very success-driven. And they probably have never even, they know the vision, they've got it all in their head, but they've probably never shared it. Um, have you come into those sort of situations and then had to try and, get that person to soften and share and lead by purpose have you have you been through that process of creating that culture in an organization yeah very often it's really this what you describe is true there, there's some genius people who lead the flock and they have a lot of things clear in their head maybe they don't maybe not the best communicators or they don't take the time because they're so driven and then you have to <coughs> um bless you you have to make a co-creation and, and, and that's really, there's the three magical words. So contribution, connection, commitment. If the team around the person that has the vision, but it is not clear to everyone. Yeah. If he or she can make people to contribute to a shared vision, contribution, then yeah. everyone feels connected with the vision that we as a team established. Yeah. And they're much more committed to make it happen. Absolutely. And those yeah. three things are often not in place, lack of contribution, lack of connection and lack of commitment. So, yeah. um, and again, think, the, yeah. You know what, something that um, really frustrates me about people, <laughs> which is a very negative thing to say. Oh, well, it's not aimed at me, is it? <laughs> My goodness, definitely not. <laughs> is that you can get people who sort of can come up with their goal. Yeah, this is my goal. And you could say to them, um, how much do you believe that's achievable, that goal? Or is it just a silly goal? And I think these, you know, when we were told to reach for the sky, ridiculous goals, I think they're the worst things for our dopamine ever. You know, I think goals need to be achievable and in section. So here's my goal. And yeah, I believe it's possible. And then you say, so what knowledge and skills and connections do you need to help make that happen? Yeah. yeah. And then you go through that. The one that the, the difference between people is whether they've got the will to make it happen yeah and i need to do. it's a very big generic genetic generic comment here 
hope it doesn't offend anyone, but I would say that a vast proportion of people are not willing to put in the hard effort to, to make their goals achievable. Yeah. What do you think of that statement? Yeah. And um, that's really also a beautiful um, distinction between, <laughs> let's say, corporate goals and individuals' goals for entrepreneurs or, you know, mm -hmm. so, so people. Because I think often what happens in a company, um, business units need to achieve certain targets and they're broken down and broken down. And some of them already thinking this is never going yeah. to be, right? We can't push back. So therefore, do they put enough effort in or activity? Maybe they give their best and sometimes it's just not achievable. But let's boil it down to, because I think that's more also the BIP 100 club audience here to, to individuals. Um, it's much easier to put something fancy on the board, on the vision board and underpin it with, you know, it, additional goals and, and pictures and, and get the emotions in place that really drive you. But then to stick with it day by day and stick with the plan and not be distracted and go for it and go through the ups and downs that eventually get you to the goal, that is the important part. And that often is lost because people get sidetracked and then the next shiny thing comes along. And, and then what, you know? I, I was a little bit guilty of that. I was a bit like, almost like a butterfly, this flower and then that flower and there's something. So people could basically win me over for projects that looking back, I better would not have touched them. That was like years back. And it also, I mean, we talked about it before. It, it also led to um, burnouts. I had two burnouts in my life and severe ones, not just some, some feeble uh, thing. So why was that, you know? Um, I did too much of the things that wouldn't really serve me. And I was also so in my own world that I didn't see the warning signs. And I didn't have a team around me that was, let's say, looking after me because I was on the road. And yeah. boom, it happened. Yeah? And it, it taught me a great, great uh, lesson. And that's also why I'm, I'm quite open and passionate to help people in those areas. You know, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I've been through a lot and I can see where people are and help them see things that they can't see by themselves. Yeah, I think, well, I really appreciate your openness about your burnout. And I think so many people have burnt out or are burning out and and have come back from being burnt out or are just actually denying themselves the privilege of being burnt out. Yeah. And, um, it, it, you know, it was interesting in 2018 when I um, had an experience, which I guess would be defined as a burnout. Um, when I went to see a psychologist and talk it through, she said, look, I, you know, I think you've got a form of depression. I said, no, I'm not depressed. You know, depressed people lie in bed with the duvet over their head and they can't bother to do anything and they can't remember anything. And I'm a high achiever. I'm out there all the time. And she said, well, there are now two types of depressions being talked about. And it's written in a book called The Curse of the Strong by uh, Dr. Tim Cantifer. Mm. And he was a psychologist at the Priory, quite a famous treatment center in the UK with lots of celebrities and anyway he was finding a lot of successful entrepreneurs and um and high high levels you know board suite suite people coming to him with symptoms but they would not accept that they had depression or were burnt out and so he wrote this book the curse of the strong and it's very powerful because the curse of the strong is these powerful these this is for positive, hardworking, striving people who just will not accept and give in and, and therefore they burn out. So I think this subject is really interesting. And then when I look at corporate um, cultures, I remember both our um, elder kids started off their graduate roles in a large global management consulting firm, a really tremendous one, which both Thomas and I have got massive respect for. But what was something very common within the sort of the graduates in their second year was the ones that were doing very well. They were labeled the underconfident overachiever. Yeah, look at that. And I thought it was a very clever phrase that, I don't know whether that's a phrase that's recognized globally or you've heard of it, but that's somebody who's not confident enough to say, I cannot do it. I cannot take any more work on. But they are an overachiever. They're very, you know, they, they, they're very good at what they do. Yes. And I suppose when you see a leader 
either being like the curse of the strong or they're managing people into that form of burnout what what can you possibly do to change that culture have you have you pulled your sleeves up and got involved in things like that what a great question that is what i think is 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 really interesting is what you just described and also this vicious cycle and how people see others and the labels that you get yeah you don't even choose them for yourselves and then what do you make with that do you take it on board and live by it um or do you sh shrug it off and create your own label that is more healthy for you um i think it really boils down to are you really following your inner voice what you really want to do and you really what you're here for or are you doing something because you ended up in that situation and this is why you do what makes sense to do because if it doesn't really fulfill you you will run out of steam and and burnout could be an option yeah um but if it really fulfills you and at the same time you also know how to balance in a balanced way look after yourself i don't think it can happen and when i look at the two situations where i ran into it especially the first one i wanted to scale and see how much i can scale so i did 150 days delivery myself traveling in different time zones lack of sleep i had over 100 additional consultancy days with uh, associates and and all I had two virtual assistants blah 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 um and it was just too much and it was there was not even a deeper sense why would i want to who what am i proving to whom yeah if i would have come to my senses i would have said okay that doesn't really bring anything and i would have stopped early enough but i didn't um and then why do you think you didn't yeah because I couldn't see for myself that the road that I was heading wouldn't lead to, to anything that would fulfill me. And I couldn't see for myself that I would try to prove how hard I can work, how much can I achieve. And, and there is no point proving it. Yeah. Um, but someone else would have showed me. I mean, they showed me eventually afterwards in, 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 in the burnout and the, let's say the treatments and the conversations. I realized a lot of things looking back. So you were only trying to prove it to yourself? Yeah, I wanted to. I mean, I was, I was, I was on the case with my business since quite a long while, and I wanted to see how much I can scale the business. Yeah, and it wasn't much about automation and 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 automated money online. It was just doing facilitation and and getting others to do as much as we can together. Um, what what I wanted to maybe the the point here could be if. If you look at the anger that you are struggling with, whoever is listening to this, um, where could the solution lie? So, for example, if you are almost like running faster to prove to yourself and others how much you can do, then stop yourself or get someone else to stop yourself and have those deeper conversations. You know, why are you doing it for? And why is this so important? And what do you really have when you achieve it, et cetera, et cetera. And you can't do that easily in a monologue in your head. You know, you need someone who asks, asks better questions and and make you realize that you're actually, yeah, you're almost like a cul de -sac. You're running down the road that, that leads not to what you think it could be. Well, and, I, well, I remember, Thomas, when this happened to me, I had this vision of what had happened to me. And it was that in 1998, Thomas and I came up with this idea of creating a social network first in the world. At the time, metaphorically, if I was at an airport, I wanted to get on this conveyor belt that just slowly took me and my luggage along really calmly. And I could walk it or I could just be slowly taken along. We all know those at an airport. Yeah. I didn't get on that one. I actually got on a different one. And I was going like <laughs> along, you know, and I was looking at other people having a life, going nice and slowly along and looking at the pictures and the scenery. But when you're on it, when you're on that one, it, it's f so fast, it's hard to jump off. And I remember having- I remember And it's like, very addictive. And and yeah, it is. And your identity gets connected to it, doesn't it? Yeah. Who yeah. you are and, and all of the accolades that you get and all of the, the external validation that you get from yeah. that. Wow, you know, you're such a fast runner effectively, or you're an Olympian, you know, that type of, 
world that you find yourself in that isn't enjoyable. Um, but when you I, see when when you see what we have now, where our where our kids, the next generation, are being inspired by somebody who's running five companies all the time, tweeting every five minutes, sleeping on the floor, working fourteen hours a week, a chip in his head, with a chip in his head, perhaps with Neuralink as well. But now we now our kids are being inspired to be like him and work a hundred hours a week and almost almost kill yourself for the sake of work, which seems to be going back all the way to the 1980s, 70s, 80s, 90s high red profile. It's almost like we're going back in time rather than becoming more mature with our with managing ourselves to avoid burnout. Yeah. I mean Thomas, Please. when you jumped off it, did you realign what you were striving for, what you were in pursuit of? Well, first of all, what was taken from me was my ability to, to let's say, do the magic one-to-one -one or in groups or on stage. And then when, when you're on this black hole, you think, will I ever even be able to do anything? And then when you come out of it, or when I came out of it, you know, I started again, but I could see things really differently and I was much more grateful for the gifts that I had and and I could see also with my audience or with my one-to-one -one coaching you know in what state they were I didn't pick that up before you know I could see who's really nervous fidgeting who is, looks really unhappy I could connect more so um, and then of course you think you know how can I create a different model and that actually led me to and we spoke a little bit about it um, to to do some online projects that was from Seth Golden, Alt MBA. I mentioned this in the past. I thought maybe that is something. And that was already 2015. And I could see I paid for the program. I was in it for 30 days with all the craziness that goes with it. It was all online. But I could see that you can really get under people's skin. They can be screaming and shouting and laughter with strangers that you haven't even met yesterday, but 12 hours later in Zoom sessions, you know them so well. And that was powerful. That was 2015. And then I thought, wow, maybe there is some way to really help people in a meaningful, uh, uh, more personal, smaller groups way and online. And what could that be? And mm. then I forgot about it again because I was, again, busy, successful doing my stuff. And then because of COVID, that is exactly what came back to my mind. How can I create something that can go very deep, can be online, but it's not a fixed class it's not a program off the shelf it's individual meaningful work that goes deeply and therefore what is working well do more of that what is not working well and let's start a conversation and then why is this and why is this and come to root causes and then what are you willing That's to do beautiful so that, that, what's beautiful about that is that you realize and i and thomas believe in it hugely is that you can build emotional intimate relationships with people on zoom yeah and I think it's really sad where there's a culture in organisations where people are now not to have their cameras on. I mean, I've done loads of speeches with people having their cameras off because this is a really disconnected, lonely world. People, especially now with remote working and we can. And I think, you know, if there's any message that I'd love people to take away from today, apart from loads of others that Thomas has shared, you know, Zoom can be really beautiful. We've created a beautiful community through yeah. zoom and when i actually meet people face to face and we hug each other and they say oh it's great to meet you i think haven't i met you have i not met you already then and you know because <laughs> yeah. you really feel like you know people and um i am i'm actually having a weekly therapy session at the moment with a super lady to talk through a few things that are blockages for me um emotional ones and you know it works brilliantly on zoom and she only lives three miles away we could meet yeah but I, it's so convenient. I love it. And I'm just as close to her. In, in the next five, we've got about five minutes left. And one thing that I'd really like to uh, address is something you said, um, uh, you know, you talk a lot about being fulfilled in your work. And it made me wonder, you know, when we are entrepreneurs, we can make choices to have a sense of purpose, design our life, make it right, go through our roller coasters. But when you're... Um, managing a team of people in a corporate is it actually possible for every job to be fulfilling for people do you think it is actually possible for everybody to fit into a job that is fulfilling okay if you take the, the wide 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 variety of jobs probably not um 
because there's just jobs that are so tough and so difficult to do and who, who would be passionate about it. Mm. I feel really, if you look at the diversity of, of human humans, it starts already diversity in the brain, uh, left brain, right brain, what are your preferences? Mm -hmm. I feel there are certain jobs that some people hate completely and others could just be so good at it if they would mm -hmm. put in the right spot. And that's a little bit like orchestrating as a leader, you know, how can you do, um, how can you achieve things with less efforting? That means people yeah. need to be in the right purpose-driven function and then they love what they do. Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I had to position my, my well accelerators, you know, for instance, it says they are, let's say, more profit with less stress. That's one. Yeah. Uh, so you can only achieve that if you really look at what is stressing you out and how can you get rid of that and what is really profitable, which is often the things that work well and how can I yeah. do more yeah. of that? So there you have to steam. Or, or let's say even, it says they are more... more more leadership with less managing that's the same thing if you have people that are driven because they're in yeah. the right spot doing the right things you don't you need to manage less yeah yeah the micromanagement is just a killer for people isn't it so yeah. this whole sort of new phrase that's come up over the last few years um called quiet quitting has that that phrase hit you in the netherlands as well we heard of this quiet quitting term it hasn't, it hasn't. quite a clever term the media in the uk have really grasped hold of it so it's people who are still in, staying employed. Ah, okay. They are quiet, quiet quitting. quitting. Okay. So yeah. they are, you know, they're just doing the, the absolute minimum to keep their job, but yeah. they're not really bothering it anymore. They've lost attachment and connection and any form of loyalty to the organization. There um, is, there's a strong theme of, I mean, you, you, you hear this in other models, it's disengaged, but then yeah. some people are even actively disengaged. Yeah, that means they're now going to sabotage acts and almost like, yeah, poisoning plants of co-workers, cutting cables. I mean this. So the the quiet quitters would be the persons that are disengaged. They do the yeah, yeah. and they don't want to. Uh, um, they don't want to be fired. They want to stay and do the minimum. Yeah. Again, if this, you know, if you lose the drive to find what you are here for. You end up in such places. You can up in such places. But if you believe yeah. I'm here for a reason and there is something that could really make my heart sing and then work doesn't feel like work anymore, if you believe yeah. in that, then you keep searching. Yeah. And then chances are you find it. I found now something that I'm much more passionate about than I ever was. And I don't have the stress because I decided a lot of my colleagues went back. They're now traveling again and doing, yeah. doing yeah. which is fine, which is fine. I decided not to do it but offer my clients hybrid solutions. So I do a lot of leadership development one-to-ones and I send people in if it's needed. Yeah, and, and, and that is what I mean. If you don't search for something that makes your heart sing, you can end up as the quiet, what? Non-quitters, what? Quiet yeah. quitters. Exactly, yeah. Oh, it's an amazing conversation. That's good, so that. many So many things that we've covered here that really show the strengths of your... I mean, it's wisdom, isn't it? I think, you know, mm. I know you have invested in courses and EQ courses and many, many others to align yourself and learn and, and things. But the wisdom that you've gathered just by caring and working so closely with companies and people is really what is the this, this beautiful ingredient that you have as a person, and Thomas. Um, and it's been a real privilege to talk to you today. And... I just want to remind everybody that's listened, look up Thomas Orths, O-R-T-H-S, on, um, on LinkedIn and connect with him. Um, it's been a, a brilliant conversation. And um, I just want to say, as we finish the show, um, Thomas and I run a community, BIP100, which stands for Businesses Personal 100. The reason that we do these shows is that we only interview our members and we will never have more than 100. And all members... Um, um, of BIP100 go through a huge screening process with Thomas um, before they on board with me um, to make sure that we're right for them and that they're right for us and that we feel that this person is a high enough quality person for us to recommend as a supplier into our quite vast networks and what we recognize is that we all chase down customers 
but actually finding great suppliers for your organization is possibly one of the hardest parts of making a business um, strong and helping it to grow. And so as a result of um, listening to Thomas and also the endorsement that we give our members by becoming BIT100 members, um, we hope that you have really enjoyed this and that we've added some value into you now through the show, but perhaps into the future, into your business. So thank you so much, Thomas, for your thank time. You. And I wish you a fantastic day, everyone. And if you're on a dog walk or you're in your car, in, enjoy the fresh air or drive safely. And thanks every, ever so much for giving us your attention. Bye, everyone. Thank you.